Hi, this is Chris. It's um, Tuesday, May the 2nd, and welcome to our monthly Connect series for uh, premium members. So let's go ahead and get started, and it's just as a reminder, as we do uh, each month at Kimball Charting Solutions, uh, we're not bullish or bearish uh, anything. We're just bullish and bearish opportunities, but not bullish and bearish different assets. We just look for you know, uh, strategies and patterns that can help assist us make quality decisions. Before we get started, I wanted to thank uh, uh, all of you who might have voted for me. Um, it came in the mail this week, the uh, Stock Twits, the website that I participated on for a couple of years, had their uh, first time uh, what they call cash tag awards, and one of the awards was for Chartist of the Year, and uh, I was very fortunate to be nominated and uh, then ended up uh, winning the award uh, through votes. And so for any of you that uh, voted for me, I just want to say thank you. It was uh, an honor to be on the list and very humbling, you know, to win. Uh, this is something that I really, really enjoy doing. And uh, I'm just uh, really appreciative of people who voted for me. So thank you. So let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to start off with the stock indices. And this is a chart that uh, we share each week in the uh, global dashboards. And this is where we applied uh, Fibonacci to the 2009 uh, lows and 2007 highs and came up with the 161 Fibonacci extension levels that you see at each one. And you'll notice uh, as far as most of 2016, this uh, 161 level for each, the Dow and the S&P, was resistance for a long time. Then the markets uh, broke above it, came back and used old resistance as new support and has pushed you know, higher. So from a 30,000 foot view, um, continuing to see uh, expansion above these uh, extension levels. And then we apply the 261 levels that uh, sometime down the stream, uh, the 261 level will come into play for the Dow at 25,000 and for the S&P at the 3,000 level. So the, the webinar has a, a lot of charts, but in some ways for uh, a bullish case, we could just uh, essentially just show one chart, and this is the advanced decline line of the New York Stock Exchange uh, common stock only. And you can see since the 2009 low, it's been in a very uh, uniform rising channel. It did dip uh, below it for a little bit in late 2015, early 16, and then picked back up. So from a, a quality perspective, um, when you lift up the hood and, and look at the advanced decline line, still see something very healthy taking place. The advanced decline line is uh, at all-time highs. Um, it's not that the market can't decline with uh, the advanced decline doing what it is, but typically if it does, it's more short and shallow than a big one. So uh, at this time, the advanced decline line continues to send a positive uh, bullish uh, message. So kind of a busy nine pack, but we'll start in the upper left. I'm not going to dissect these too much, but just kind of want to let each of you know what each chart is. And as you can see, uh, as I move the mouse around for uh, viewing later on, the symbol for each of these charts is uh, tucked in in the gray bar in the upper left. But on the top row, on the, on the left is the S&P, in the middle is the Dow, and the upper right row is the NASDAQ. In the middle row on the left is the Russell, in the, the middle of the middle is mid caps and then the value line geometric on the right. And then the bottom row looks at Germany, uh, France, and London. So the main take that I just uh, want you to see here from a 30,000 foot view is they all have somewhat similar patterns that off the 09 lows, uh, they have a, a very uniform uh, rising channels taking place. Um, they're all breaking out above uh, last year's highs within these channels and, and acting healthy. The ones that are in most question uh, are on the bottom row, and I'm going to dissect each of those more individually. But just a big picture uh, snapshot, you're still seeing uh, quality upward movements uh, in these major stock indices uh, from around the world. So as I said, we're going to dissect a little bit. Uh, for a long time, uh, with membership and uh, on the blog, we shared that the DAX was a, what we felt was a very important index. Uh, that it can have big impact, impacts on uh, indices in the states. So uh, this is a clean look at, at uh, just the, the DAX index itself. And you can see since 2009 lows, it's been in a uniform rising channel. It hit the top of this channel here in uh, early 2015 and then proceeded to go from the top of the channel to the bottom, potentially make an inverse head and shoulders with the lows uh, last year. And then we see a, a solid move higher. 
two weeks ago, or last week, excuse me, was a, a pretty strong move in all of the European indices following uh, the election that came out presumably like the markets wanted. The thing that uh, we want to watch here is uh, there's no doubt the trend is up and the DAX is attempting to bust above 2015 highs. So a uh, bullish pattern that's taking place. What the bulls would not want to see here would be a reversal uh, at the 2015 highs and it turned down. A look at France. Um, Similar look, except for that it's not at all-time highs. You can see the, 2000, it's, the index is currently below the 2007 highs on the left side of the chart. It does remain in a very uniform rising channel since 20, the 2009 lows. So similar. It's, uh, I always find this kind of fascinating, everyone. But here's the 2015 uh, highs, uh, almost similar to the, the DAX chart that we just shared. And so the, the CAC40 is, is testing the uh, 2015 highs here, and also the red resistance line. So the, the trend is up. Everything is, is looking healthy. If there's a, a place that a trend reversal uh, could take place or would be meaningful, would be at current levels. In other words, this would be a place that the bulls would not want to see a reversal. Uh, a break above the dual resistance where the arrow is would just constitute more of a bullish message uh, coming from France. So uh, London, I find this uh, really interesting. This is um, a 30-year snapshot of, of London. The majority of uh, the last 25 years has been spent inside rising channel one. So what I did is I took uh, the channel uh, one, either the top or the bottom line, doesn't matter. I just created a parallel line which became two. And so at two, we took this counter trend bounce right before uh, the London uh, markets collapsed and just created this parallel line and you'll see that for the majority of the time then since 2008 London has stayed within support of bottom line one and resistance two. Over the last uh, couple of years uh, in pink a rising uh, wedge has taken place so I, th I think we just want to really keep uh, close notice that uh, this index is doing well and the trend is up. It did hit uh, the apex of the bearish rising wedge at three and this channel and then I enlarged it down below so you can see where it hit that channel and then broke from the wedge and it's created a series of uh, lower highs uh, over the last uh, few months and so nothing really bad going on here uh, the key to me is if uh, for London to send a bearish message it would need to break down below the 2007 highs which I believe comes into play around 6,900. So there's still several percent more, but uh, if, if we would see weakness here, this would be concerning for the bullish case uh, in the States. So kind of surprised to see uh, what's going on. If you look real tightly uh, in the, the inset right here, this was last week's pattern. It tried to do really well and pushed higher and ended up creating a, a bearish wick. So it's just got uh, the, it was May Day holiday in Europe yesterday. So it only has one day of trading here. But uh, again, the trend is up, a little bit of weakness after hitting a key resistance. So uh, the, the, the takeaway to me would be that, you know, the DAX, the first chart, the France and London are all at really key levels that uh, uh, the trend being up, but could be a reversal point that would be concerning for the bulls if it took place. So now look, come back to the states. Uh, this is a four pack that we continue to share uh, frequently in the global dashboard. We have the S&P in the upper left, the bank index in the upper right, the Russell and the transports. Uh, all, uh, all of the trends are up. Uh, they're doing well. But if there is a, a place that they are, are struggling a little bit, it's up against the top of these channel resistance, particularly uh, in the S&P up here and the Russell. So it's not that they've done uh, poorly, but uh, once they hit this uh, resistance uh, a couple months ago, they've chopped sideways a little lower, and then they've come you know, back up some. The one that would have me most concerned would be the bank index. We're going to dig into it next because it hit uh, dual channel resistance in December and has backed off. And then the, the transportation uh, chart in the lower right I find intriguing. I would say that it's a low odds pattern, high impact. And what do I mean by low odds? Well, the one thing that I notice that, you know, oftentimes when a, you know, an index is at a certain point, let's say 100, 
and then if it would fade off of 100 and come back and break above it, uh, that would constitute a horizontal breakout, and this would be taking place and uh, make common sense of any asset. But one thing that just stuck out to me, and we're going to dig into it on later charts, is how the patterns of 2000 and 2007 look similar to here. So we'll come back and revisit this chart a couple from now. But uh, again, the two that interest me the most are going to be the bank index and the transports, and we'll dig into those. In uh, early December, Joe Friday came out and said that he thought that uh, the banks could remain uh, weaker than the broad market for a long period of time. Now, this is a long-term chart, and why did we say that? This is, uh, what, about a 17-, 18-year chart of, uh, of the bank index divided by the S&P. And so in December, when Joe Friday said that uh, the banks could struggle against the broad market or be a weaker or underperformers, the one thing that, that caught my attention was the dual resistance that was taking place and then the, the relative momentum of banks compared with the S&P was higher than any time in 2000, and it was even higher than uh, the momentum uh, at the time of the financial crisis when it began in 2007. So we'll notice that since uh, dual resistance was hit, momentum was high, you can see that banks have actually underperformed the S&P since the 1st of uh, December. So we're looking at four to five months now that the banks have uh, been underperformers. In other words, it would be better just to own the S&P than banks. So I mentioned earlier, this is one thing that really caught my attention. You'll notice that uh, up here there was two, the different color, the green and the blue, two different uh, channel resistance points came into play in uh, just a few weeks back. Uh, and you'll also notice that there's potentially, you can see coming into here, a head and a shoulders top. So I took the 2007 highs and the left shoulder, and you can see where the right shoulder could come into play. So this is going to be really critical to see what banks do here, because uh, humbly, uh, in the historically, uh, the broad market has struggled to really uh, excel if banks don't go along for the ride. So uh, bulls, you really want to watch this case uh, in the upper right to see if this is a, a top in the bank index. So here's a closer look and a game plan that in case that pattern read on the top was correct. This is actually the inverse bank or financial ETF and its symbol is SEF. And this is on a weekly basis to where you can see that SEF potentially is uh, making an inverse head and shoulders. Uh, the neckline would come into play at one. So this uh, uh, pattern is far from proven. Uh, but if it would break out above resistance at 1 and SEF would start taking off, obviously that would reflect uh, weak banks. And also I would, wouldn't be surprised to see it spill over into the broad market. So a game plan of mine uh, is if SEF breaks above uh, resistance, I want to be owner and owner of the inverse bank ETF. This is a closer look at the transport chart that we uh, talked about earlier. And this was the, the case where actually a, a, a breakout took place from horizontal resistance in 1999 and 2007. And th so the red line is actually an upward slope. So you'll notice there was kind of this V pattern with an upward slope. But then when the right side of the V broke, we saw a, a lot of selling pressure in the transportation index twice that took place in the 2000s. And so you see a similar pattern taking place in the upper right. And so I, I share that uh, earlier that this is a low odds pattern. And, and what did I mean by that? And I think, you know, the odds are low that this thing will repeat. Uh, forget the, the big decline. Just repeat the pattern itself. But if it does and it breaks support at two, I think this thing could have a very high impact on the, the bullish case. It would be obviously bearish if support would break at two. Um, this is kind of a, just a, a fun little quirky situation, again, that low odds uh, that it's a true read or that it will repeat. But if it does, uh, I want you to be really well aware of it and the impact that it could have if support was broken at three. And you'll see uh, this past week at three uh, is quite a large, and this is last week's pattern, everybody. This pattern at three was uh, 
a, almost an engulfing bearish, but quite a reversal. You can see the, the notch on the left. It opened here, tried to go higher, created a bearish wick and closed lower than the prior week. So this potentially has uh, some weak uh, underpinnings to it. So let's keep a, a really close eye on the transports. Uh, this is the uh, S&P, uh, both charts. The left is S&P weekly closings. The S&P on the right is high-low close. And what I did was I applied uh, Fibonacci extension levels to the lows in 2016 and this high in the fall of 2016, and then applied Fibonacci extension. We've been sharing this each week in the global dashboard. But the uh, 238 level roughly uh, has come into play. You can see how it was hit, and the S&P has backed off, and it's making another run at it. You can see it dissected the closer in the, the bar chart you know, on the right. Again, these are both weekly charts. You can see a, a few uh, bearish wicks have taken place um, up here at this 238 you know, level. Uh, not really significant ones, but uh, the bulls would uh, want to see a breakout of the 238 level. And uh, from a bearish case, what you'd want to look for here is a, another a bearish a wick and a reversal at this key level. So the, the trend is still up. This is a, uh, obviously a resistance zone that's causing a little bit of a headache for the S&P at this time going into the uh, so-called uh, weaker time of the year as sell in May and go away. You know, there's hardly uh, anything, you know, outside of the perceived valuation. You know, uh, we're going to look at some of those later. There's a lot of talk about valuations that the market is overbought. But from a power of the pattern and lifting up the hood perspective, uh, you know, we started off the, the webinar with the advanced decline line, just looking healthy and you know, strong. This is the only piece, you know, really right now, everyone, that's uh, it's not alarming by any stretch, uh, but just continues to show a little bit of weakness. And this is the RSP, which is the equal weighted S&P 500 uh, ETF divided by the S&P. And so since uh, one, which came into place, um, oh shoot, clear back in December, you can see that the ratio has created a series of lower highs since. We saw a, a support line get hit here and then a rally. And, and again, this is a daily chart. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight days ago, uh, seven days ago, we kind of saw that reversal and then we've seen a, a decline. So this is not enough to, to, for the, the bears to, to, to get happy you know, over or the bulls to be concerned. Uh, but this is a, a, one of the few divergences that's going on underneath. And essentially, you know, the, the bullish case, you want to see this ratio uh, going up because that uh, reflects that, you know, when you think about the equal weighted versus the cap weighted, uh, we're going to discuss Apple in a little bit, but uh, some of these indices are cap weighted. And so just a few stocks that are very large influence the index a lot. So the, the RSP index is something I, I really beg you to, to keep a, a watch on and to see if it's stronger or weaker than the broad market. So uh, nothing alarming, just a, but there is a little bit of weakness uh, taking place. If support would take place or break, excuse me, at two, um, you know, somebody could make the case as the head and shoulders top, and, and that would be a negative. So we'll address that if it takes place, um, but a little bit of negative divergence, one of the few things that you can point out. So we're going to kind of look at sentiment uh, just for a minute, and, and sentiment al along the line of the reflation trade. Um, so this looks at the copper-gold ratio on the top and the 10-year yield on the bottom. And so if, if the world's going to grow and going to reflate and act strength, you'd want to see both of these heading higher to be an inflationary piece. So both of these did start heading higher prior to the election, and then if you'll notice, if you just take 2007 and, and go up, essentially since the first of this year, both of these have created a series of lower highs, putting in question uh, somewhat the reflationary trade. So, so far, the, the, the longer term trend towards reflation is a series of lower highs, which would constitute more along the theme of uh, disinflation or just, you know, lack of, of growth. So for the, the reflationary trend to come true you'd, or be accurate, you'd want to see both of these break out. So they're, again, they're struggling at overhead falling resistance since the first of the year. This is a, another a good inflationary uh, 
uh, indicator, which is the TIP, TLT ratio. TIP is the inflationary um, protected bonds uh, ETF divided by TLT. Uh, you'll notice that the deflationary trend, the pink uh, channel, has been in play since 2011, creating a series of lower highs and lower lows. Uh, at this, the point number one, uh, this started heading higher before the election and then really picked up steam post-election. But you'll notice again, since the first of the year, uh, there's, uh, it's done nothing more than chop sideways to, to weak of late. Um, a lot of resistance, a, a resistance cluster was hit at two, and you'll notice in a, a sharp break. And right now, the ratio is kissing the underside of resistance here at three. So if you're in favor of the reflationary trade and the world growing, you do want to see this ratio getting stronger and breaking out. From a uh, contrary or a bearish case to the reflationary trade, you would not want this to be a head and shoulders top with lower highs. And if weakness would take place here and you see the ratio start heading south quickly, it would really say that uh, the reflationary trade is losing a lot of steam or air. So a big price point for an important uh, inflationary indicator uh, right now as well. Uh, this is a look, and I apologize, this uh, shouldn't be in here. This is from last month, but since since we're here, this is a steel ETF, and, and since this point in time in one, this thing has, has been uh, rather weak. So we're going to, um, it was a couple of charts, I apologize, shouldn't have been in there from uh, the past. I liked them a lot, and I forgot to take them out. So now we're going to switch to the, the interest rate environment. And so one of the things that uh, I wanted to look at is, Earlier this year, uh, when bonds had collapsed, you could see there in the lower right, this is bond sentiment. There was hardly any bulls. And then this is an example when how we can use uh, positions and sentiment to, to help out our trades. But we shorted bonds uh, last July, and then you'll notice how much, uh, how crowded the, the bulls, uh, or the, excuse me, people were very uh, bullish bonds here, and we shorted, and then the, this, the whole thing had flipped on this huge decline. So the majority of people just uh, not too long ago had become uh, bearish on bonds. So here's an update on uh, the 10-year yield on the left and the 30-year yield on the right with momentum uh, on the top. Uh, you'll notice that both of them remain solidly in, what, 15-year downtrends. And, and, of course, we can make a case of 30-year downtrends uh, that's still in the 30-year downtrends as well. Both of these hit uh, dual resistance uh, here at the first of the year after the sharp rally, both of them as momentum was very, very lofty. And you can see that both have then backed off the 10 and the 30 year and so has momentum of late. So this is a closer look then at TLT and we shorted, uh, premium members shorted bonds, excuse me, uh, last summer here uh, as I think it was almost 90% of people were uh, bullish bonds uh, at the time, and, and they were obviously on the wrong side of the trade. Uh, TLT has retraced 61% of uh, the rally off of the 214 lows, where you can see that Doji star reversal here. And so then it chopped sideways for a few months. Now, a couple of weeks ago, it looked like a breakout of the sideways pattern was taking place, but you'll notice right here was a bearish reversal pattern, and so TLT has backed off some. So now it finds itself back in that sideways chop over the last, uh, what, four or five months. Uh, up above, you will see that uh, momentum had gotten oversold, and it is creating a, uh, a series now of higher lows, which tends to be a positive um, situation for, for any asset, and particularly for bonds here. <clears throat> we uh, premium members went and uh, this is AGG, which is a conservative way to play bonds. Why, why do I say conservative? Uh, the yield on AGG, as an example, is uh, lower than TLT. It's an aggregate. It's an accumulation of long and short durations just all in one. If you want to say it's more of a chicken way to play bonds, I would agree with you because uh, that's what I did. But we bought bonds uh, here uh, just right before the first of the year at one. You can see that AGG rallied and then came back, potential double bottom, and then AGG has, has rallied some more and is now uh, the decline over the last couple of weeks. This, this is a daily chart reminding you. It's testing support uh, at two. So we're up uh, not a bunch on this position, a couple of percent. Um, 
uh, not even quite that. And then we've been able to collect dividends uh, over the last several months, you know, while we've owned this. So we've had this, what, five months or so. So um, really key what happens here uh, with for AGG uh, at two. Uh, still long and uh, like uh, what's going on, you know, here, but a key support has, has been taken place of late. The bulls um, can't be too happy with that reversal of a pattern a couple of weeks ago in, in TLT. Just to kind of, um, from a seasonality perspective, this is the 30-year bond seasonality. Uh, there's, there's four different lines, but one looks at the seasonality over the last five years. The, this shaded uh, kind of pinkish soft red is 10-year, and then the gray is in the 20, and then this is year-to-date. And so what I would just wanted to show is the, the idea of sell in May go away. Uh, tends to talk about that stocks, you know, are weak between now and October, even though stocks haven't been that weak in the, the month of May, or, or particularly in the month of May, I think I heard for several years. But uh, typically bonds, this is a good time, so you'll notice whether it's over the last 5, 10, or 20-year patterns that the majority of the time from um, May to June, uh, bonds rally through uh, October. So from a seasonal perspective, we're, we're not quite there, uh, even though we are the 1st of May. Uh, but bonds typically do their best uh, from the 1st of June uh, on. So we'll want to be aware of that. Uh, this is a, uh, another update on sentiment now on the 10-year yield. And you'll notice uh, this is when we shorted bonds uh, last July. You can see that the sentiment towards the 10-year uh, yield was almost 100% bulls, and that took place at the high, and this is this is where AGG was bought. But I did want you to notice, you know, this, that there, uh, we're going to look at another sentiment table, you know, coming up, but this is from a sentiment trader. You'll notice that uh, despite, I would say, not a large, uh, you know, move up in the, the bond, there's been a heck of a move up in optimism towards bonds. So maybe this is why bonds are backing off, because just a few too many people have gotten on board this bandwagon maybe a little too quickly. This is uh, from uh, Ned Davis Research, and so this is bond futures on the top with Ned Davis, Davis Research sentiment on the bottom. And it's kind of a busy chart, but it kind of boils down to this. There's a couple of levels of 60 or above the median from 40 to 60 and then 40 and below. The thing that stuck out to me is when you can see there's two different timetables from 1984 on the left to 2017 or just the last 10 years. But any time that this indicator is uh, above uh, what the level of 62, you'll notice that uh, it's long term or it's gain uh, per year coming off of that. It's a negative. Uh, almost 5%, and you'll notice then over the last 10 years, a negative 1%. And all this means is that historically, that when sentiment is lofty in, in these bonds from Ned Davis Research, bonds don't tend to do well. Now, when it's 38 or below, you can see that the average gain over the last 10 years going forward for the next year was, uh, what, a 12% gain and over the last 30 years was about around a 9% gain. So it's just moving from very oversold levels up above the 40, uh, excuse me, up above the 38 level. So from Ned Davis Research's perspective, bonds are still on a longer term uh, perspective, uh, closer to a low than a high because of that extreme pessimism. So kind of speaking of, of sentiment and, and people's feelings, I wanted to kind of just spend a couple of moments on a kind of a fundamental 30,000 foot uh, viewpoint because uh, we're hearing a lot about valuations being lofty and, and many indicators that, that they are. And this comes from Doug Short or dshort.com if you're not familiar with them and you like analysis on, from the fundamental side, um, I'd really encourage you. Uh, Doug's a good friend and uh, he's got a, a great staff helping him out in the, today or in these days and they're doing a, a super job continuing Doug's work. But this is uh, the, the Q ratio, just a different uh, measurement on uh, valuations, and this is going back to 1900. So it's a pretty good um, benchmark in time. And so I think the, the one thing to stick out is, 
you know, to me is if we would, we, we can't erase history and there's no reason to, but I just kind of want to share that, uh, you know, historically this, this spike up was more of an aberration, you know, just, and the reason I use the word aberration is, well, you, you can't find it any other time in a hundred years. So it's a little bit uncommon. And the reason I just mentioned that is what if we take this 120 level and just slice it off and we didn't have this blip up to 160 or, or whatever, that you'll notice that current levels uh, are, are very close. There was, uh, see, not even the 2007 peak, you know, was this high. This was a couple of years ago. But the, the peak in the late 60s, uh, the, the Dow went nowhere for 15 years, and we don't have to explain what happened in 1929. So from a long-term perspective, even including 2000, we're obviously a lot closer to highs than lows. Uh, here's the, the point of 2009 to give some perspective how it was below the mean of the last 110 years. So uh, obviously not as extreme as uh, 98, 99, and 2000. If you'd remove those uh, from our memories, which uh, we legally can't, um, this, this valuation is still pretty lofty. This is another one from uh, Doug Short, and again, this is going back to 1870, a combination of uh, the Dow and the S&P. I believe they put this together. So kind of a busy chart, but just kind of run through this. This uh, red uh, rising line is uh, what they, they term their regression line. In other words, that's just the, the average uh, growth or slope to, to the markets. And then what they've done is they've tried to look at the times when the market was above or below. So as an example, uh, in 1929, the market was roughly around 80% above its long-term regression line. And you can see the beginning of the 1920s, uh, it was, what was it, almost 60% below the regression line. So there's probably a good reason that we saw this from undervaluation to over, and then we heard, had the crash going into 1932, and again, then it was 67% below the regression. So what kind of catches my eye is in 2000, the year 2000, uh, the market was 139 percent above uh, the regression line. That was that aberration in history. Uh, there was the 2007 high. The 2000 financial crisis low was actually 16 percent below the regression, and currently it stands at 97 percent above the regression. So if we would uh, take out again uh, the 1998, 99, 2000 right in here, you'll notice that we're above 2007 highs. We're above the high in 1966 when the market struggled for a decade, and we're also above the level of 1929. So none of this is bearish by itself, but we just have to face the reality that historically, if you were to put a brand new dollar in, this is not where long-term bull markets excel in long-term returns. Um, you know, this is not a place that long-term bull markets have ever gotten started that did well, you know, 10 years out. So. Not a market timing tool, just a great uh, perspective tool. These were some of the things that Sir John Templeton shared with me in the late 90s when he said he did. He thought at best the market would be flat 10 to 15 years out. And it was things like this that he was sharing back then with me. So this is um, another popular one that's talked about a lot, and it's margin debt. In other words, it's investors that are actually borrowing money to invest in the stock market. So this is uh, going back, what, 22 years uh, the blue line is the S&P, and the red line is the margin, uh, the levels of the margin debt. So you can see in 2000 it was high, then it actually got even higher in 2007, and we're now at all-time highs in, in margin debt. So we're going to look at margin debt just uh, in one more way here, and that's actually then flipping this a little bit to where the S&P is still in blue, but the margin debt is in is inverted in red to show you what I kind of like as the fish mouth patterns. So you'll notice there was a, a big spread between uh, inverted margin debt and the markets in 2000, and we know the results from there. There's the flip of that spread in 2003, which is a great time to buy. Here was the fish mouth spread that was taking place in 2007, quite large. There's the financial crisis, which was the exact opposite. And then, pardon me. Um, now you can see, so far, the mother of uh, all fish mouth spreads. And so this gets a lot of attention, and I don't think we should overlook it, but Ryan uh, Dietrich and I discussed you know, a year and a half ago that in and of itself, margin debt is not an issue. 
It's when margin debt is high and it turns significantly lower is when it becomes an issue. So I wanted to kind of share, this is something to kind of solidify that. This is a chart of the S&P going back uh, into the, the 90s. And then what this looks for, this indicator at the bottom, is when the margin debt crosses the zero line. In other words, its year-over-year -year change turns negative, because that's the key, uh, as I was just trying to share. Margin debt in and of itself being high is not the issue. It's when it's high and it turns down. And so what, this, uh, what we've done here in sharing with you is, is nothing more than a, uh, a buy and hold. So the bottom line is a buy and hold going back and investing a hundred thousand dollars in the S&P in, in 1994. But then when the year over year and the margin debt changed, you just did nothing more than just went to cash. And it doesn't even include any reinvested dividends in this example in cash. And so that's why you'll see this line goes flat. It's just saying get out of the S&P. And then when the margin debt turns back above the zero line over year, year over year change, it's just saying go back 100% into the S&P. So I just kind of wanted to share that those are the significant times because you can see this year over year change take place here. And that was uh, right at, what, 2001 and when the market had struggles and then it did again 2009. There was a couple of other signals that didn't mean a lot, but when you do step back that, um, what, $100,000 in the S&P buy and hold uh, turned into just under 800000 and in the uh, example of using margin debt and then using the margin debt as a sell trigger, because everybody's concerned about it being high, but this is examples you only would happen to get out when it's year over year uh, went negative, you can see that that same $100,000 grew to about $900,000, $950,000. So um, not intended to be, to be a buying tool, but I just wanted to really show you where we're coming up with the idea that margin debt high is not the issue. It's high when it turns you know lower that you want to become more protective of money. So if we see this year over year change uh, take place, we're for sure going to alert members you know on that. Oops, I apologize. So we're going to now switch and we're going to look at some things in the, the metals market. And so to start off with, first here, this is the U.S. dollar gold uh, ratio on a monthly basis. So when this ratio is going down, um, that's good for metals because the U.S. dollar is weaker than gold. And that's when, uh, this is when the huge gold uh, and silver and minor rally took place from the early 2000s to 2011. Uh, but once that started heading higher and creating a series of higher lows, this is where uh, gold, silver, and the miners have struggled for years. So when this uh, cluster of resistance was hit at one, this is where uh, I went and purchased uh, GDXJ um, two days after Christmas and then sold it into strength. So the takeaway here is there's a, a critical support line uh, that's taking place at two. And so metals bulls would want to see support give way, which would mean that the dollar is weaker than gold. Uh, so right now, the, the thing that gold bulls have to be most concerned is this is a series of higher lows that have now taken place for six years. And this is nothing more than another test of support. And so, uh, support is support until broken, and if a rally takes place at two, uh, one should expect further weakness in gold, silver, and miners. So a really key uh, test of support. Uh, and again, the, the bulls want to see support give way so that the six, seven-year trend breaks. This is a, <clears throat> a look at the Swiss franc, and you know that the franc, if you've been a member for uh, quite a while has been extremely important to us. We used this resistance point in the franc in 2011 to suggest that metals would be uh, flat to down for years to come and struggle, and, and they have. But as we look back over the last, this is what a 25, rough, almost a 25 year uh, chart pattern, the majority of the time the franc has stayed between these uh, two outer bands. The, the blue uh, middle band is nothing more than a parallel. Uh, of the upper and lower uh, bands, but you'll notice that uh, 
the, the franc has, has struggled, it tried to break out and it didn't, and then it, it shot way up and, and then fell lower. Um, so the franc has continued to struggle uh, along with metals. So support was hit here and that's where we uh, bought the GDXJ right after Christmas. But a, really a key pattern because um, we're seeing a series of lower highs and lower lows and then we're seeing this rising support take place. And so this is a, a, a pennant pattern that's narrowing that's going to be uh, humbly, I believe, very, very impactful to the metals uh, trade. So here's a closer look of, um, of the franc, and I'm, I'm sorry that it's uh, off on the, on the right side. Let me just see real quickly. I apologize. Let's see if I can. Hey, I hope that's a little better. But this is a, a, the franc over the last few years, and you'll notice that the Swiss franc is uh, creating uh, a descending triangle pattern. And uh, two-thirds of the time, this leads to uh, lower prices, uh, significantly lower prices when support breaks. So um, this, pennant, this uh, descending uh, triangle, excuse me, continues to narrow and narrow. And so it's a really key uh, what takes place. So if the franc breaks to the upside, uh, it's a real positive. If it breaks to the downside, it's a negative for the franc and also a very negative for um, for metals. So the metals bulls do, do not want to see um, support be taken out. Here's a look at GDX uh, that we took a small position in GDX uh, recently, but just kind of a, a snapshot. There's a, a lot of lines going on here. But the main thing to me is this green shaded area that we're seeing a series after this breakout of higher lows uh, coming off 2016. Uh, when this triple support was being tested here at one, um, that's when we went and bought GDXJ. We didn't buy GDX, went more aggressive and bought GDXJ and in, in, in a matter of, I don't know, what was it, six weeks or so, GDXJ rallied over 40%. So it was a, a really nice bounce coming off of that. Uh, but we were a buyer at one and sold in the strength. We were a buyer again of GDX at two and sold in the strength. And then we purchased GDX uh, of late looking for a support test at three. So far, nothing's come out of the position in really a good or a bad way. Um, but if uh, support is taken out uh, at three, then we'll walk away from the position. This is a, a, a look at the, the U.S. dollar. Uh, long term, that it's a lot of two different channel re, uh, resistance points uh, were met in the upper right of the screen. So here's a closer look at, at what's taking place. That uh, this uh, resistance line, or this top of this channel, excuse me, that's been in place for a quarter of a century, came into play uh, late last year in the dollar, and then you'll notice it hit it and it's backed off since. It also, there was two different Fibonacci, uh, one, or 61 and a 161 level, which to me was r really rare that both of them could come uh, to be in play within 1% uh, in price of each other. So we're seeing some, uh, some weakness take place. So for uh, commodities and particularly the metals, you'd uh, like to see if you're bullish uh, that area, uh, continued dollar weakness. So here's a real close-up of, of the dollar. The 100 level, which is this green line, it's, uh, as you can see, it's played around on both sides of, of the green line. It did break above it by around 4% at the first of this year. And then since the first of the year, it's traded in this pink channel with resistance being at 1, and it's created a series of, of lower highs. So now we're back below the 100 level, and you'll notice that it broke. This is a weekly chart. So this is last week and then, what, two days this week. But right here last week, it's broke below it and it somewhat kissed the underside of resistance. So it's now below um, this short-term, you know, well, what are we looking at, uh, roughly one year. It's below this old support line as resistance at two. So uh, the metals bulls want to see further U.S. dollar weakness. I think really the 104.94 is... Uh, 
such key levels. The 104 would be an upside breakout and the 94 would be a downside breakout. So as it continues to chop in that 10% range from 94 to 104, it's not giving us a, a lot of great clues. Uh, but again, if you're bullish uh, commodities, you do want to see further dollar weakness. Here's something that um, we've been sharing with our metals members for years and years, and this is the silver-gold ratio uh, on a weekly basis going back, what, 30 years. And you'll notice that there were times that the, the ratio, if you're bullish gold or silver, you want to see this ratio heading higher, which would be reflective that silver is stronger than gold. And so um, you'll notice that we've highlighted that there were these bands of of a falling uh, resistance in the ratio and then when it broke out silver each of these times did really well uh, just a few weeks ago uh, you'll notice since 2011 the, the ratios continued to send bearish signals uh, metals gold silver and minor bulls want to see this ratio breaking out and it hit resistance uh, again here just a few weeks ago then you can see it's really given back you know sharply so um, this ratio is is continuing to send uh, bearish signals to the, the metals complex and uh, suggesting that each rally is nothing more than a counter trend rally and a bear trend. So uh, again, quite a bit of weakness uh, taking place, you know, right here. This is not sending a bullish message to the metal space. So moving to a different commodity, the oil sector, this is a 30 year snapshot of uh, crude oil and it has spent the majority of the last 30 years uh, trading between these, uh, excuse me, the upper and lower bands. And you'll notice that this was uh, a year ago in January to hit this, the lower band. We've had a rally uh, take place and it continues to bang on making an attempt to get back into this blue shaded uh, rising channel. And uh, if it does, it would be you know very bullish for crude, but it struggled and that's around the 50, what, $3 uh, range. And then it hit it recently, kissed it again, and it's backed off. So crude oil today at one time, I believe, was off roughly 2.5%. I think it settled down just a little less than 2% you know, on the day. But the bottom line is testing rising support at 2. And so to me, this is very critical for the most important commodity in the world. And with the correlation of um, stocks and commodities being pretty high, excuse me, between crude oil and commodities uh, over the last a couple of years. To me, this is uh, very, very important what takes place uh, at this support line at two. Um, I want to just kind of update you on the sentiment of uh, uh, traders' positions in crude oil. Uh, this was in 2014 when a very crowded trade was taking place and the majority of uh, what we want to call, the, some would say, the dumb money was making a huge bet long on crude oil and that's when it started to collapse. This was the, one of the largest crowded trades in crude oil history. And you saw the, the trade that reversed itself into to last year uh, at the support in the when crude oil was down around $30. And then as crude has rallied, people started reestablishing those that crowded trade uh, again. I apologize on that switch. And so right now, uh, traders are very similar positions to where they were in 2014. So on the prior page, we showed that crude was up against uh, what 30-year channel resistance, and now was testing nine-month rising support. If that support would break, this chart would reflect that there's a lot of people on the wrong side of the trade, and that crude oil could be rather soft. So really, a, a big uh, price point uh, for crude oil right now. This is the uh, comparison that we share frequently of crude oil to the the NYSE index. And they don't always uh, correlate. Uh, there's times that they do and they don't. Uh, the blue shaded area would reflect that over the last two years, uh, numerous highs and lows have taken place in both of these at, at virtually the same time. So correlation has ramped up. Uh, this is a chart of uh, today. And you can see some of that weakness taking place, uh, driving it down just a fraction below uh, rising support. That's about a year old and we're back at highs of just a, a few months ago. So uh, very, very important for crude oil to hold here, particularly with the chart that we just looked at uh, with a crowded uh, trade taking place. Because if support would break at one, uh, it would be very negative for uh, crude oil, and I think it would spill over into the broad market. 
Sticking to uh, you know importance and commodities, uh, this is the Thomson Reuters uh, commodity index uh, uh, commodity index on a monthly basis going back um, on the left chart into the 70s. Now this is the same chart twice, just with a couple of different um, chart patterns applied, uh, but the, the same uh, message is coming from this. We started sharing right here uh, in July of 2014, which would be three years ago, that this looked to be the right shoulder of one of the largest head and shoulders topping patterns that I had seen, and that if it was true, these commodities could really uh, suffer and see a, a lot of selling pressure. And uh, we all know that they did, and, and uh, crude oil uh, dropped enormously. Now this is a, a key uh, support line that comes into play clear from the 1980s and it was hit uh, a year ago and so it, uh, this was potentially the neckline and so we've seen a counter trend rally in the commodities index. It's went up to hit the 23% retracement level and then has backed off some. And so the, the arrow tie-in is this reflects that since uh, Oops, I apologize. Since the 1990s, the majority of the time crude oil has spent inside the, the heavier blue channel. And you'll notice that it broke it. And it, this gray one is nothing more than a parallel of the darker blue channels. And you can see a reversal wick here. And then it rallied up. And so here's a dual resistance point just a, a couple of months ago. And the index has faded. So when we think of the reflationary trade that is so uh, commonly talked about, um, you know, uh, on the financial markets and stuff, that's where the reflationary trade started. But this is nothing more than a counter trend rally in a, a downtrend that's been in place since 2011. So uh, this, the outcome of this, everyone, you may say, well, Chris, I'm not trading this index or whatever. Well, you, no one can trade it. But I just want to keep this perspective in mind from a 30,000 foot view that a deflationary, disinflationary trend continues to be in place in this index creating a series of lower highs since 2011. So really um, important from a macro picture and also um, positioning how this thing uh, uh, unfolds. And so much of it's going to be based upon crude oil in the charts that we've just shared on the prior pages. So just a, another look at the same commodity index uh, before it started turning south. Um, crude oil position, crowded. We just looked at that. So to finish up, uh, everyone, this is just our, our current positions. And you can see that we have um, uh, a lot of uh, long positions and there's no short position. I typically try to take 10% uh, size position in, in each one of these so you can see uh, that we've been uh, pretty heavily invested for several months and it's, it's paid off. Uh, so these are the positions that we currently have and I'm just going to real quickly go through um, some of the chart patterns of what we own. So just a couple of days ago this is the uh, cow ETF which internally uh, is based upon the price of cattle and live hogs and uh, we had traded that uh, earlier in, in the year on a breakout and then we sold into strength You'll notice for several months it did nothing more than chop sideways. Then last week you'll see a breakout at one took place and we went back to the Cal uh, ETF. It's been uh, acting uh, you know, well so far, a, a big breakout. And as you can see here that the next uh, resistance zone comes into play around the 25, 25, 15 zone. And um, right now when this chart was made this afternoon it was trading at 2486. So that's only, uh, this resistance is only 1% uh, above current prices. So during the day today, I sent you an, an email to just bring the stop up. So the stop is now above the purchase price. So we're going to protect our capital. And if we'd be fortunate, you know, that uh, this ETF would break above that 25, 25, 15 zone, uh, it could run a, a good bit for a while. This is a Walmart that was... Uh, purchased some time back and it's, it's been doing well. Uh, it's trying to break above the uh, bullish ascending triangle pattern uh, here. And so you can see that this top blue line is some resistance. This is a weekly pattern. So last week, so far it appears uh, on a weekly basis that the stock made a doji star, 
which could be a, a, a reversal pattern. So I'm going to watch this really close and we've uh, brought our stops up uh, significantly. Walmart's treated us uh, well and it's uh, outperformed the S&P while we've owned it. This is a look at uh, IFA. Uh, IFA, uh, the European uh, flavored uh, ETF had formed a bullish ascending triangle pattern. Uh, bought it on a breakout and you can see that it's done fairly well and we've continued to uh, raise stops on this position. It's uh, outpaced the S&P uh, since the purchase and the next key resistance line would be in the 65-66 zone. Um, this is uh, XIV. Uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, we uh, established the, this position and it was two weeks ago yesterday, you know, actually uh, right here, this is an XIV daily chart. XIV had uh, declined a large percentage, 20% uh, just in a matter of days. And when we started looking that uh, on the flip side of this, the VIX index had rapidly uh, rallied in the face of just like a 1.5% decline in the S&P. What that equated to was one of the largest rallies in fear of people being scared on one of the smallest declines in the S&P. So that really caught our attention. A uh, support cluster uh, came into play at 1 and we uh, uh, bought XIV uh, on a Monday morning. And so the position, we've sold, been selling some into strength and at this time uh, we're up around 20% on remaining shares. Um, overhead uh, resistance. Uh, it's going to be something that we're going to watch if we can, you know, make it up to that price point at the top of the channel. If it does, we'll probably liquidate the remaining shares that we own. Uh, this is an example. Uh, you know, we've been sharing that the last two weeks of April, um, or excuse me, that April itself uh, was one of the stronger months of the year with an average of 2% gain. But almost all of that gain took place from essentially tax time, April 15th to the end of the month. So as soon as uh, April 17th rolled around and this window opened up and XIV was on support, uh, we, we purchased that. And, you know, in my heart, all of the purchases that I try to, to pick up, we want to make money. But another goal is to, when we're risking capital, to try to outpace the market. So we've gotten lucky and blessed on this trade that this is a comparison since XIV was purchased, that the S&P uh, during that two-week window uh, pretty much came in right on par that the average uh, gain of the last two weeks of April is around 2%. You can see that as of adding another day to that, it was up 2.3%, uh, but the uh, XIV was up 20%. So that was almost a tenfold increase on our, on our money by owning XIV over the S&P. And then lastly, uh, Apple um, came out with earnings after the market, and the last I saw before I turned everything off to start the webinar. Uh, Apple was uh, down around 1, 1.5%. One uh, but th uh, what this chart reflects is that we took the high in Apple in May of last year and the low in, in uh, excuse me, two years ago in the May low of last year and applied Fibonacci when Apple broke above uh, resistance at the 134 level, uh, what was a buyer and it continues to uh, add strength. We've uh, brought our stops up on the position. It's outpacing the S&P since uh, ownership. And then we'll see if it gets there, but the 161 extension level uh, should be an easy number to remember. It's 162 on the price of, uh, of Apple. So uh, again, we brought our stops up ab above uh, purchase price, so we're protected that even if we were stopped out, we'd make some money. So I'm going to send you more charts. This is the list of uh, May seasonality stocks. Uh, I'm going to didn't want to over deluge you. I've already done enough of that today, but I'm going to send you some more charts. But these are the charts: uh, the average median gain for the S&P over the last 10 years is 1.61 percent, with the average uh, gain being 0.33. These are the stocks that have done well during that time frame, and you can see they've all outpaced. Uh, the S&P by a, a good margin. One of the things, as uh, I don't know that it means anything, but when you start going through the list, a the largest concentrated percentage that so far that I've found is in the healthcare industry in the month of May. 
I don't know why that it is, or if some of you know something about that, you know, let me know. But uh, I want you to be aware of this list, you know, that's, that's done well, and, uh, and I'm going to be sending you some uh, individual Power of the Pattern charts on, on each of these. So again, I want to thank you for your membership. Thank you for the votes for the uh, Chartist of the Year on, on uh, Stock Twits. And I appreciate your business you know, very, very much. So uh, my best wishes to all of you, and, and thank you for attending the webinar. And we'll see you next month.